<laughs> well, I uh, I know you're going to the, the Ferrari dealership, so I, I wanted to see, do you prefer the Italian motorsports cars or the uh, American muscle cars? That's an amazing question. I am a car collector, and I, I never talk about it because people will think I'm boasting. I've always been fascinated by machinery of all kinds. I love engines. I like motors, and I've always loved cars that are special. Okay, let me tell you what I have now. My daily driver is a car I bought new in 2008. It's a 12-cylinder Mercedes S600. This is the workhorse. It's the greatest car I've ever owned. Zero to 60 in four and a half seconds. This thing is a tank. It is a tank. And i got to tell you something else about that car. The gauge steel that they used in it is much different than the new ones because I drove a new one and it's too light for me. So that's number one. I hear that these cars are going to become collector cars because they were built better than the new ones. That's a little inside story. Okay, now as far as cars go, I own a, a Dodge uh, Hellcat, which I got last year courtesy of Chrysler the Motor Car Company, one of the first in America. All black, astounding car. It was almost too fast to drive. You had to really learn how to drive that thing. It sounds better than any car I've ever driven. I keep it in a garage. I rarely drive it. I love that car. Greatest car ever made. Love it. But the handling is nowhere near that of the Mercedes. i got to tell you that right now. The Mercedes goes over like curves and come off the Golden Gate Bridge. The thing lopes over the broken road rather than bounces into them. And a great different difference. In a straight line, though, you can't beat that that Dodge. The sound of it is awesome. It's it's a astounding car. Now, when it comes to exotics, I have a 1970 Jaguar XKE Series 2 Roadster, light blue. Stu gorgeous thing. I never drive it because you know Jaguars, right? I mean, I've done a lot of, had a lot of work done to it. Triple carbs, 4.2 liter, magnificent machine. Handles beautifully, but I don't drive it. I mean, I'm not crazy. I recently purchased an XK150 1961, uh, 3.8 liter drop head coupe, gorgeous car. Again, I don't drive it. It's a collectible. That's all it is. Now, you asked about Ferraris, right? I had a red 430. Do you know what that model is, the Ferrari 430, the red one? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've seen it done. Yeah, I had a 360 before that, which was a modified racing car, very hard to drive on a road. The 430 was fantastically better. I had that for years, bought it new in 06. I traded it two months ago for a Ferrari California in a light blue. It's a four-seater. I love the four-seater more. It's a little faster. It's got a better transmission. It's a more of a GT car than a sports car, which I don't use. I'm not the right age bracket for a sports car. I mean, sports car. You know, an older guy in a sports car is a stereotype. It's kind of an embarrassment. So I don't even like to be seen in one. And so this is more of a GT kind of car. And um, it's a fine car, but I wouldn't take it on an everyday. I wouldn't take it everywhere on an everyday car. Like, for example, I went into San Francisco on Saturday. I wanted to go into the city, meet some friends for lunch, dinner, whatever. I only took the older Mercedes because the thing is a workhorse, as I said. I wouldn't drive a Ferrari into that city with the broken roads. Does, I, that doesn't really answer your question, does it? Yeah, it uh, it does. I, I, I've been listening to you for 15 years, and, and I love when you talk about cars. I, I think I watched a lot of the same you know, TV shows on Velocity. The, yeah, exactly. The I watch them every night. I get so bored of the pornography and the hatred and the anger and the liberalism. I wind up watching guys with ugly beards fixing things and making cars run. I had a beautiful car. I shouldn't have sold it. I had it on a, on a stage with me years ago, a 65 Caddy convertible, a red one. I sold it about four years ago for 24 grand. I shouldn't have sold the car. It was magnificent. So a wonderful man bought it, I think, in Alaska. I don't know where the thing is. If he's listening, I still have a set of keys for it that I found. Uh, did you ever sell a car that you wish you didn't sell? You ever do that? Yeah, yeah, I had the a 75 Cadillac Eldorado. It was my first car ever. And uh, actually I I drove it into the ground, but uh yeah, it 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 was sold uh oh, probably Yeah, that see that car I should have kept for the Savage Museum, which will never exist. It only exists in my mind. No, my archives and all. I had a dream once of building a Savage Museum where the red Cadillac would be the center of it, and all of my audio tapes would be in a certain area where you can go and listen to them, and then all the videos would be running. You know, you could press it and watch that, and the books and the manuscripts and the this and the memorabilia. But what's the point? I mean, uh, what, what's the point of building a thing like that? 
That's a little too egotistical. Nobody would be interested in all of that stuff. But I'm not going to throw the archives out. I'm going to just give them to the family so they can burn them and throw them, <laughs> throw them away for me. All right, my friend, thanks for the call. Be back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O. So I got an email on my Facebook account from the young man who uh, was lonely. He said, thank you. He's actually a real person. I'm not going to read his name. He said, thank you, you helped me, and thanks for the book and all of that. I mean, it's hard to believe there are real people who are, are really looking for some kind of advice. I think it's a friendly voice out there, and I'm glad I could fill that role once in a while. Because, hey, look, there is a limit to politics. You know, it's not the be-all and end-all over the world. He says, hey, Michael, it's the call of lonely guy. Thanks for talking to me today, Dr. S. You did make me feel better. Thanks for the Christmas gift of Government Zero. I'm looking forward to reading it. And there are other things that I shouldn't read. And it's about the, it's about the post I made this morning over the weekend, really. Have you figured out why it's Merkel, the potato-faced monster from East Germany's communist past, and why it's been the radfems here who are flooding the West with Muslim males? Have you been able to see the pattern? They hate their fathers, so they hate white males and Christianity. And they think these Muslim men will treat them better. Got it? That's what I wrote. That's my analysis. It's one way of looking at it. The feminists and the leftists are fundamentally suicidal, and they also hate the Christian white male. The radical feminists have targeted the Christian white male for 40 straight years. That we have known. But now that they are embracing <clears throat> an invasion of our nation <clears throat> by Muslim males, you have to ask yourself, are they sane? That's all. We know there's a war against the Christian West. We know that. We know that the hardline communists are aligned with the Islamists. We also know that National Socialists under Hitler had strong alliances with the Islamists. It's history repeating itself. And that's why Merkel, who was named Man of the Year, uh, I think that's more apt than you may think, who comes from East Germany with a communist past, is leading the destruction of Germany. She's leading it. You know that potato-faced monster that was put on the cover of the $1 a year Time magazine cover? Okay, you get the picture. 855-407-282 is the phone number. Let's take a caller or two. Jocelyn on KSFO in San Francisco. What's your question or comment? Yeah, Savage, what would, do you think there's a difference between hybridization and GMO um, I feel like they get lost. That's a great question. No, I'm glad you said that because I thought you were just going to talk about GMOs. But sure, there's a difference between hybridization. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a variety. It, hybridization is a slower version of GMOs, genetically modified organisms. That you, we understand that, correct? Yes. Are, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Can so what is it that what is it that you fear about GMOs? There's a lot of hysteria about that, as there is about global warming. What part of genetically modifying an organism worries you? Well, I'm just not sure if it has any effect on, you know, its makeup, or is it really just speeding up the process, or are they genetically altering it so that it could, you know, be cancer-forming or something to that effect? All right. Well, we all have those questions. I don't think there is a definitive answer. And I could give you a cavalier answer, and I can give you a realistic answer. I personally could care less. I do not obsess on whether a food that I'm eating is a GMO-free or a Schmendrick-free. It doesn't matter to me at a certain point. I can't walk around tripping over every food label in the history of the world. Having said that, for 50 years, I've looked at everything I've ever eaten. I'm very careful not to eat foods with sugar in them because I know that sugar is the number one poison in the Western food supply next to pesticides. So let's start with the things to really worry about. Organophosphorus, pesticides, I don't want them in my body. Sugars, I don't eat them because I know that they're poisoning my body. So thank God I'm still pretty healthy, but the thing is, is now we're getting to a whole new realm where people fear the Frankenstein organism as a result of genetically modifying the genes, meaning of an organism, right? But at the end of the day, you know, we are all genetically modified individuals. You know that. Your parents, for example, did 
selective genetics, didn't they, by picking each other to make babies? Aren't we all a product of some kind of bioengineering? Yeah, I think it just is a little scarier when it happens in a right. lab. No, I understand. I'm making a broader point, which is parents select each other based upon, well, they fall in love. But what is falling in love? It's a lot of selections made in falling in love. One of the selections is, wow, she's great or he's great. He'll make a great father or she'll make a great mother. That's a form of genetic engineering. You're picking somebody to mate with to make a baby. So in other words, we're all a product of selection, genetic selection. The question is, does, does speeding it up, is what you're asking, make Frankenstein organisms? I don't have a definitive answer to that. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Let me give you a warm, cuddly Christmas story. This should make all of you good Christians in America feel good. Illegal aliens who fled over the border, broke into our borders. Undocumented minors, they're called by psychopathic social service liberals, have been given a welcome. And they broke into America, and Friday afternoon, the first of hundreds of the illegal aliens from Mexico were checked into a camp and conference center in Texas, in Ellis County. They were assigned nice, clean rooms with white sheets, given dinner, and they have an indoor pool to swim in. And you wonder why they're running out of Mexico? They don't have to work, by the way. No way, it gets even better. The illegal alien teens are coming in. They're getting the swimming pool, the sheets. They got the, uh, they're getting education and recreation. They're getting soccer. They're getting arts and crafts. Yeah. And in Dallas, attorney Domingo Garcia says he's organizing lawyers willing to represent the illegal alien invaders in immigration court. He said, make sure their legal rights are protected, that they're in a comfortable place. And even though they're separated from their families, that they have a Christmas that teaches them what American values are like. Hey, Domingo, I'll tell you what American values are like. When we get Donald Trump as president, you'll find out what American values are like because you'll be on the same bus going south that they'll be on, Domingo. That's, that's what American values are, is putting you on a bus out of the country as a seditious... See, I didn't mean to do this. I apologize in advance. That's an American value. It's called protecting your borders, language, and culture. Not giving a bunch of invaders a swimming pool and a, a, a soccer camp. What kind of nation is this? How can the country survive the liberals who have destroyed it so far? I don't know if there's any going back in reality. People say to me every day, do you think we can save it? I'm not so sure. You'd have to reverse everything that the psycho in the White House has done over the last number of years. How hard do you think it would be to reverse what Psycho has done and what Psycho is going to do? Psycho is trying to impose his demonic will upon the American people every day of his life. Psycho does it every way he can. The Psycho invites a fake rabbi to the White House to deliver a sermon about Hanukkah that is nothing but a left-wing left -wing screed. It has nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Judaism, nothing to do with the tradition of the Jewish people. And he invites, on top of it all, the furthest left woman, so-called rabbi he could ever find, to disgrace Judaism even further. He's embracing every far-left doctrine imaginable. It's beyond anything that a college would be doing. This is how bad this is, and there's no opposition. Okay, I made my point. I've editorialized enough. And he gave a speech this morning saying that the United States is attacking the Islamic State harder than ever. Listen to this one. Trying to calm Americans about terrorism for the third time in three weeks, President Obama, who speaks loudly and carries a limp stick, said that the U.S.-led coalition is attacking the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq harder than ever? Really? Then why are they still operating? You could have defeated Nazi Germany in less time if you had a real war leader instead of speak loudly and carry a limp stick. The only people that Obama saves his viciousness for are the American people, the taxpayers, and those in the Republican Party who don't knuckle under to him. Otherwise, what do you got to say? He took Roosevelt's talk softly and carry a big stick and reversed it. Talk loudly. And carry a limp stick. That's what we see. 
And it goes on and on, and it gets worse and worse by the day. Here is another one for you if you just tuned in. The Liberal Church of Hollywood. Norman Lear, remember him? The man who created uh, people 